why don't you give me a rundown, man? What, what have you been up to? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot to unpack since I haven't even had spent the time to unpack mentally from the trips because they were kind of nonstop, right? One of the biggest takeaways, uh, or I should say two, right? Two big takeaways that I got from just this just this past February. One, um, oftentimes it's not something new that I have had to rediscover, right? It's just more being reminded of what I already know uh, when it comes to, hmm. say, the things I got to do just in any business, right? Uh, more specifically on the marketing side. And then number two, there is absolute power and proximity. Being mm. around these people is entirely different than going through a course or watching a video or anything of, of that nature that doesn't involve that live component. Because it's there, there's true energy there and there's just so much that you can get from the people that are you're surrounding yourself with, right? Not only is it energy, it's mindset, it's activity, it's problem solution. All of those things can happen and accelerate your, your growth or your, your path if you so choose to, right? One of the things that I do when I go into uh, deciding on an event that I want to attend is I'm very intentional with, with that, right? With the decision and what I want to get out of it. Um, and I just choose to, it's something that I have uh, ingrained in just my practice of, hey, if I'm deciding on going to an event, what am I, what am I looking to get out of it? I'm not going there just to go to figure things out and kind of just be around stuff. Like, what am I getting? What, what is that problem? Who do I need to meet? What do I need to learn? What are those things? So I'm very intentional with my time there, right? Um, I, know, I know you're talking about how it like really influences mindset and everything. How much of it mm -hmm. is kind of proof of concept? You know what I mean? Like being around people that are in the same trenches that we are. And then you see somebody that's like two, three steps ahead. I know I've taken that away from basically every event I've ever been to where it's like, oh, we're doing the same thing, you know, and it's natural to not really notice the people behind you. Not, not that you don't notice them, but you know what I mean? Like you don't compare there you're always comparing upwards. And I feel like a lot of the time what I got is just new ideas I never thought of. And then also just the evidence like, oh, if I do this, like it could take off, take off. You know what I mean? Like where you see the actual yeah. outer rim possibility, like the upper echelon where it's like, I didn't even consider that as a possibility. It, it goes back to just the whole concept of the four minute mile, right? Like mm -hmm. literally everyone thought you couldn't do it until someone did it. And if you're not around people that are in the trenches with you that are, around that problem attacking it from different ways and finding out different solutions i mean how else what what like you're going to surround you're going to be trapped in your own echo chamber so that was the biggest thing for me because i've been kind of out of that I, I met with larry um the other day and we caught up because we haven't seen each other in a while and i think that was the biggest thing i had said you know we've been out of the just the live event i mean everyone has relatively but you know more mm -hmm. so like i've been out unplugged from certain communities and out of the live event um just arena for a while so those are things that you forget and oftentimes, like, it's because you you forget how valuable it was, right? And, and yes, like, even though if I map to you how normal live events go, you're going to tell me, here's the structure, right? And you sit, you and I sit there like, oh, I've seen this play before. I've seen this movie, right? I know how things are going to go. There's going to be a case study here. There's going to be a blah, blah, blah there. And then they're going to pitch me on this day. They're going to pitch me again. Then hide your credit card because you know it's coming. Right. Even with that same type of process, right, the fundamentals are there, right? The execution of that and the true value that was there was what I really appreciated, right? I'm like, hey, I know the pitch is coming. I even told the guy, right, in uh, from the first event, I said, brother, like, if you didn't pitch, I'd be upset. Mainly because, I mean, I knew it was coming, but I also see the value that you're bringing. So it's almost as if, like, it's not almost as if, it truly is. You would be doing a disservice to this community if you didn't provide more value. And with more value comes the cost of time, money, whatever the heck you want to call it, right? But bro, I sat there, I looked at this guy, he barely spoke any English. Just a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, just and basically this from his story on stage, he was in an entirely different business. He was working for a restaurant. Fast forward to when he was speaking, he had 100 clients, 100 agency clients. And I was like, mm. okay, so limiting belief kind of shattered. Let me, you know, I'm like, let me kind of figure that one out, right? What were these things? One of the themes was, unattached income, something that you and I have been talking about in the context of customers versus clients, right? That type of uh, business and setting up that way. So those are some things that really stood out to me to say, oh, there are other solutions that I haven't found yet because probably one, I was in my own echo chamber and two, I wasn't surrounding myself with people that were in the same industry or business, but they were all solution oriented as well, you know? Mm. So do you almost go to an event with the intention that this is like, historically, I've gone to an event with the intention to learn, but I'm almost hearing that you're going to an event with the intention to buy. 
Mm, good point. Well, I knew that going to the first event, I knew that there were some things I needed in my new role with this with this company that I'm working with now, right? To be able to help with some backend resources. I'm like, hey, if we can utilize this software and then stack what we need on top of it by doing very minimum custom work on top of it, it's going to get us there a lot faster. So my intention was I need a service provider that can solve this problem. That's where my mindset went. Right. Mm -hmm. So going into that event, I was like, I knew I physically knew I, I knew no one that in the room, never seen you before, other than say like some videos and stuff, never met anyone. So I didn't have any expectations of and probably no expectation of being in being comfortable in a corner of the people I know as well. Right. So I could have either sat just stood on the wall or really just been solution oriented because I'm not leaving my family and, and going out of town just to kind of figure things out and, and, and have fun. Right. That's just never been my MO. So, yes, in the mm -hmm. sense of. Was I looking to buy? I was looking for a solution, right? And the solution was there in the form of people and a, a program. And you knew even before you went there, it's like, yeah, the solution is in this room. I just don't know who has it. And then you're just it kind of working the room, mm -hmm. working the angles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely was. get that. Dude, I can't mm -hmm. even take away with it. Like, you know, myself, because we're in, you know, just a little north of Toronto, essentially yeah. the, the majority of, of conferences and stuff, they're all in the States uh, and not only in the States, they're in California. So, you know, like for me to go to that kind of meetup is a lot more, you know, it's two to $3,000 to show up for a couple of days. Right. So it's, yep. a, it's just a different kind of movement for me, but mm -hmm. the ones that I have gone to, even like the first one I ever went to was that Billie Jean one where I think I met you the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and there Dennis, you was kind of speaking. And the, the funniest thing that kind of happened over the last couple of weeks for my business and i definitely know the way that kind of dennis you does it where he embeds the idea he embeds the thing and i feel like i don't even take action on it for kind of two three years but mm -hmm. the content factory idea where it's like using all of the different tools where it's you know essentially making one long form piece of content breaking it down to a bunch of shorter ones figuring out how to turn those all into blog posts all that kind of stuff uh basically we've been going with that right now using all of the different tools and like the what we're seeing with it so far is still almost too early to look at numbers. But right now, I 100%, I know this idea came from Dennis Yu, but somehow it, it sounded like I came up with it in my own head. We're putting out five blog posts a week. Uh, we're putting out two to three recipe videos a week. And they're taking out, like the first one we dropped had 22,000 views in the first couple of days. Uh, blog post or video? No, so that was the reel that connected to the blog post. You know, And then what we're doing is we're using the blog post as a way, one, it's an SEO play, but it's also a way that when we're trying to activate an email list, we're not only selling. We're like, hey, have you seen these other recipes we published this week? Then you check we it out value. and we give you opt-ins. It's only value because like I, I felt bad after a while because you've just seen all the unsubscribes, all of that kind of stuff. So it's like, how can we make it where these emails are good to open? And then that that blog idea. And then also recently, just all these tools have kind of fallen into place, like whether it's chat GTP or um, just kind of some of the editing stuff, some of the stuff on TikTok. But mm -hmm. like the, the content strategy is crazy right now. And it all goes back. If I think about it, it all goes back to that first conference. So as much as in my head, if I'm trying to say, you know, like, oh man, going out to say like the go high level one in, in October, in my head, I know that's kind of two, three grand for 72 hours. But at the same time, if I'm still pulling off it as inspiration four years later, like what are we even talking yeah. about here? Yeah. And, and to echo your point, during the, the second week, right, the week in Dallas, um, I knew I was going to know more people there. This was the event uh, that high level you know, through. And it was a SaaS mastermind, right? So going into that event, I knew I was going to know Robin. And I knew I was going to know Rob Bailey, who was going to be, he was the keynote speaker for those three days, right? Outside of that, I knew that, hey, if the week prior, I went to a third party provider that builds and supports high level users, what am I going to take away from the actual high level community? And who else is plugging into that source, right? Because that was really where I was like, okay, I know because I've invested in Rob's program. Um, uh, we're, we're great friends as well, that he's going to deliver value, right? But I had to look at it strategically in the sense of who else is going to be here that is also going to help me facilitate the business needs that I have with working with this startup as well. But what came from that was exactly what you had said. There was numerous people on stage that had brought things back in their own story to the time that we all had together in SOG. And mm. of the heavy hitters that were on stage, I have a picture. And I, and you you know every single person in this picture because you're a part of the damn yeah, community. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. 
Paulson. Right? Uh, Paulson, dude, the, Jeremy, yeah. Rob, Stephanie, uh, Robin. I remember back in the day where Robin was in the group talking about like, yeah, I'm working on this new software. Mm -hmm. And Rob Bailey, it, like it must have been 2018 where he does a speech about database reactivation and just like a way to reach out because it's such a lay down approach. And man, yeah. I feel like I sh I've left so much money on the table by not implementing that at that time. But it's weird how it evolves, you know, because there's a certain part like you're not ready. When you're not ready, you're not ready. That's it. That's it. Because it, there's so many things you have to learn along the way and you can streamline it. And I think, you know, in essence, that's really what those kind of events do, right? Or taking the extra, I mean, they, yeah. the extra bit of coaching with it. So what was the other that, event you went to? That was the one. That was the Dallas mm -hmm. one, right? The Dallas one was the second one. The mm -hmm. first one was um, one in Newport. So Southern California, close trip for me. Um, that was uh, thrown or hosted by a company called HL Pro Tools. So high level Pro Tools. And they're a third party, right? But they're agency owners as well. And there's heavy hitters that are there. So my biggest mm. takeaway from that event was a lot of the backend stuff that they offer as a service is going to be great, right? They have plays that work. They have also support that works as well. So those things answer the question. But on top of that, what they have is the network, right? It's the network that is providing those resources that I really wanted to make sure that if I wanted to ask myself, if this is going to be a good fit or not. And I, I feel as though it will be. So I walked away with it from here, here's solution and here's people as well, right? There's solutions in terms of plays, uh, resources, and then there's also uh, just great people to, to surround yourself with. Dallas, um, very similar, met some other um, providers that do things on the front end of the um, the service that I need, right, to build on top of. Um, and that was cool. And then I got to just connect, reconnect with some old friends. And the beautiful thing is, because they've been active in these communities as well, and we've all kind of gone our own ways. It's cool, because we can sit there, catch up, and then we're all introducing each other to, 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 to new people, strategic mm. people. And that was, that warmed my heart, man. I mean, they, those, those relationships were, are deep rooted and I felt the love and I felt the, the friendships because it wasn't a one way street. Right. And mm. we can, we have these stories and we have these experiences and that's what I truly um, value out of, uh, out of reconnecting that way. And that's why I sent you that message on messenger saying in October, yo ass better be here because mm. I wouldn't say that just because I miss your bro. Let's just crack a beer. No, it's like strategically mm. knowing you having our friendship and even in, in, in our world, we got to be around. If, if you want to be an all-star, you got to surround yourself with all-stars. Right. And that's just really where it's, it's got to be, you know? Yeah. All right. I'll do it. My wife's already signed off on it. So <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And then, um, so we'll talk more logistically offline uh, about uh, that. Cause mm. there might be some ways for us to be able to do it, um, at a little bit more of an, uh, an affordable, uh, route, you know, and mm. I'll just say now, like a buddy of mine, he, who's it, who was, he signed up for, um, you know, Billy's programs a little bit later, but he lives like, but 20 minutes South of me, but we never see each other in California. <laughs> we always mm. see each other like at some, some other event, whether it's out of state or just out of the local area. Right. So the, there's a, a residence attached to the hotel where he got basically a third of the price per night on. He was like, bro, you're in a, oh, a hotel. Cool. I'm in a one bedroom and they have two bedrooms too. So we, we may just want to do that and just do like a two yeah, bedroom yeah. or whatever and split the cost on that. Yeah. All right. Run it. Yeah, dude. The um, only, and then like, honestly, my, my only perceptions of, of like Texas in my head, I'm thinking cowboys and barbecue, you know, yeah. like those are, those are the things that come to mind, you know? And then well, like be a cool. thousand hours of Joe Rogan talking about it. Well, and the other thing is it'll be cool because you're going to see all your marketing friends that we haven't seen in years. So just being able to catch up and see what each other's doing and collaborations are there because the, the, the transfer of trust is already there. The relationship's already there, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the beautiful thing about it. Cause you connect with someone and be like, yo, this person does this. Have you worked with them? Yeah. Right. So I was like, cool. So it just makes things go. It accelerates whatever path you're on so much faster that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's tough to quantify like the, the cost of like, if you would pick that provider wrong, because like you never know had you picked them right. But at the same mm -hmm. time, like, you know, I was saying, or my friend was saying, the, the guy that I started my first company with, he actually went to work for like a subsidiary of Google. And then like, he's doing some other kind of big cloud computing thing now in Japanese, which is wild because he's from Canada. But essentially with him, he's just saying like, every time I tell him what I'm charging a client or somebody, he's always like, you got to triple that, man. I've mm -hmm. seen the results. And I've also seen in these big companies, like basically being able to show up as the guy that delivers is like, they just don't have it. You know what I mean? The giant organizations, some guys are really, really skilled, but at the same mm -hmm. time, like being able to show up with a big bat and hit home runs, 
whenever somebody asks you like, Hey, how are we going to do this? You know, like I tend to always take deals that are like, kind of like, I'll be part of the success. I'm so confident that we're going to win that I'll tie sales to my marketing. But mm -hmm. also at the same time, like, what if your sales team is bad? What if something mm -hmm. changes? What if, you know, what if you have to hire 10 new sales reps? Now your sales percentage goes from 40 to 10, you know, mm -hmm. it, that has nothing to do with me. Uh, and that's basically, yeah, I took an hour of, of heat on that one yesterday. Which is good. I mean, you think about it too, mm -hmm. like you're not going to, you are going to hear that message when you're ready to hear that message, right? And you'll do with that message what you will do with it when you're ready with it as well. Because as you had said earlier, and you gave credit to Dennis in terms of content marketing and content factory stuff. Yeah, absolutely. One minute videos all day, right? And looking at that concept now, as everyone, all these creators are flexing on, oh, I don't have to, we don't like I got this much growth in terms of followers and I never had to pay for ads. Okay, dude, but understand the origins of how long we've been yeah. in the game for, right? This is a shift in certain ways in terms of how you're testing things now. So the beauty of that for us, because we've been in the game so long, you can chalk it up to wherever you want, right? Making more mistakes, being in the, in the trenches a lot longer. I just know that these minor tweaks to whether it's a new tool or a different way of unlocking something or solving something is going to help us accelerate a lot faster because we've been through that. We have that experience. And oftentimes experience is chalked up in just how much scar tissue do you have? How long have you been in the game? Yeah. What's worked, right? There's a certain part of just like a, a built-in, I've seen this before, I've done this before. Like for example, TikTok right now is in the golden age of TikTok, yep. right? But I was there for the golden age of Facebook. So I've seen it. I know what it is. Like I was looking at numbers. Let's flip to segment two, show and tell. So this week I've been looking at numbers. Um, and basically what I'm seeing is across Facebook and Instagram, you're getting like a cost per M, cost per thousand impressions of something upwards of $20, Ouch. which is, it's wild. You know what I mean? Uh, and then you start- market. Well, what it is to me is just like, oh, you know what? Users are leaving, mm -hmm. right? So right now the advertisers haven't left. They're still doing it. They're trying to figure out the other platforms. So it's basically, there's a, there's a surplus of advertising dollars and a shortage of actual users. And then when you go to TikTok, depending on what style of ad you're running, you're getting like a cost per M of between three and $8. So minimum it's half price, right? The only thing I'm getting like a good cost per M on is like, if we're doing recipe reels, that stuff is doing really, really well. Like doing like a voiceover. I did this one video where I made like a grilled cheese, bacon jam sandwich. Yum. Yo, it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. Like 20,000 views the first day off it for the first time we dropped on a channel, right? Like that that's yeah. big considering whatever before that their average view is like 2000. So mm -hmm. it's just but then you drop other recipes. It doesn't really work kind of the same way. But then, yeah, essentially what we're doing right now is trying to figure out how to go from being overly reliant on meta to how can we actually convert on TikTok. And with TikTok, I feel like people are like, they do not want to see the ads at all. It's still old school Facebook where it's really, really organic. They trust people. But like, you know, even me as a user, like if I see something from, I don't know, Campbell's Soup, whoop, that, that's gone before it hits. You know, like, that's why I'm telling my video guy, Kyle, who's watching this and awesome. You should have seen the presentation he gave me today. I'll tell you that after. Uh, but essentially when we're putting out videos, like if you don't have that offer there, the first second, I think it's gone or it's just completely natural where it's like, say I do the same bacon jam video. And at the end, it's like, Hey, if you want to get this kind of bacon with this offer, then opt in now, you know, you could do it basically natural at the end of a video that gave them the content, gave them the value, gave them all that kind of stuff, or it has to be in the first second. Yeah. But I feel I like mean, anything I'm, that's not that it's done. Yeah. And I always want to piggyback off that. I'm also seeing like, even in just the world of talking heads, right. With talking head, TikTok videos, they are a lot rougher, if you will more authentic or organic or they it looks like ugc it's literally someone talking into their microphone like this and they're jump cutting with literally their phone natively just talking right it's none none of the fancy stuff they're not using a dslr they're not coming in with it from that standpoint as well because of what you're saying right it's the shift is now i can smell an ad from a mile away and my swipe game is strong i ain't here for that the moment they see it whoop, gone right tell me okay wrong. it's exactly right but is that one of the reasons that people like talk right now? Because they they don't really have ads. They do have ads. And the ads that are performing look uh, like normal content. Yeah, true enough, eh? Because yeah. when I look at that, I'm like, wait a minute, why is this person telling me a story about his product or a service? And you look down, it's sponsored by it. I'm like, 
got me though because i it took me a few seconds before i realized it and it's not even to say the messaging was wrong because obviously it took me that long to realize it was something off right so yeah i mean and it's different because if you think about just the just think about how users are utilizing the platforms and why they're on these platforms and who is on these platforms driving that right um neil patel i just got an email from his team i think it was like yesterday right just about the power of vertical video right yeah Yes. And I, I saved that one. Thank you, Neil. It's, it makes perfect sense because the generational shift, right? Consumer mentality and the way people are actually consuming and going to places to consume content is different now. So as most people have been saying, right, just at least in our world, right? Um, the younger generations are leaning on TikTok and say, you like TikTok before YouTube to find the how-tos. They're not even going to search. So in an effort to combat that, now Google is starting to index vertical video and they're uh, basically putting an emphasis on YouTube shorts, right? So it's kind of like if the demographic is doing this, then they're having to zag as well. So it's very interesting to me to kind of see that happening because, and again, this is just opinion, right? But if we're looking at a generation that was bombarded by all the gurus that are selling shit that most of the times is just a repackaging of free YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. High tickets the way, low tickets the way, find me out here, blah, 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 fabricated, um, you know, fabricated ce celebrity or influence. So all, most of these people are just trying to sift through all the BS and be like, are you a real person? Do you actually do what you say you do? And do I like you? That's why I, I feel as though even with TikTok and the generation now, it's not only about being siloed. I feel as though that's, that's what one of the issues that Instagram is having right now with just kind of altering or changing their algorithm to, to kind of compensate for, for, for what's going on in just reality, if you will, in, in social media. Right. Cause like there's two different avenues or two different sides of the coin. Some people argue silo your content, be known for that one thing first, and then explore out and expand. And other people, more of the TikTok strategy strategists will say, go wider at first because you're going to appeal to different audiences. Yes, we can go down both rabbit holes and have that discussion around that. But it is very interesting because to me, what that says is I want to know Kevin first. If I like Kevin, talk to me about the shit you do. No like trust, right? Mm -hmm. No like trust. It goes back to day one stuff. And I feel like that that is the avenue really on short form video in general, right? Because I yeah. was talking to my team today. Um, like I told you, I got this guy, Kyle, that works for me. Um Dude, this guy's amazing. He, he's absolutely amazing with video. Earlier on in the week, what I said to him was, you know, I, I asked him to basically do a couple of TikTok ads courses, watch a couple of videos, you know, gather the information and think about how we can apply this for ourselves. This morning, he sat me down, me and Jamea, and gave us basically like an hour and a half front to start speech with references and and all of these different kind of points about what we should be doing, all the different styles. I'm telling you, it's the best course I've ever bought. And it was just Kyle dropping it. We were luckily recorded it. We'll put that whole thing out after. Awesome. Uh, but some of the things that he was, you know, definitely kind of emphasizing with it is the TikTok search outnumbered the Google search. Uh, mm, I think wow. he said in 2021, which is crazy. And then like also to, to talk about why, it's because it's more effective. You know, I'm going to see this video in 40 seconds that could condense, you know, a, a three month course, you know, I could do a, th or sorry, a three hours, three hour course. And you can show me right now. I've been putting or, out all those cooking videos, but they're all like, I literally watched them on TikTok. I watched it three, four times. I learned oh, how God. to do it. And then I did. That's it. huge. That's huge though. What you had said was, Hey, what I, what I would have to watch a 20 minute YouTube video for, or read a 20,000 word, like, you know, pillar blog post for, I could consume that and get my answer in 40 seconds. There it is in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Mic drop. Why, why the it's, fuck TLDR? There's a goddamn acronym based off that, right, bro? Too long, didn't read. Give me the fucking TikTok version. Tell it to me like mm -hmm. a fifth grader. This is stuff that we know. <laughs> but at the same time, like I've been, I've definitely been caught up like where we're making all these blog posts or something. We have to make them a certain length because this is searchable by Google and we I have to it. do it a certain way. Yeah. And you have to disguise the fact that you're adding SEO in to, to still make it appear to be user-based content. Yeah. Luckily now we can put those shorts right in the article. And I feel like that's actually going to jump it up. Really I think, fast. And I think that's my point, right? I think my point when I said, we already know that is just the, the top of the call. It wasn't walking away and reviewing February. There wasn't a lot of aha moments as in, oh shit, this is new. This was more of a reminder mm -hmm. of the things I already knew. So if you think about what we're talking about, it's a reminder of what we already know in terms of being able to repurpose your content. Because what you said was, we understand 
based off of best practices to become searchable in terms of having your content be searchable by the largest search engine in the world. When it comes to text-based stuff, we have to have certain best practices for writing a blog post. But what we're also doing is we're stitching along, right? We're stitching a, we're connecting a reel to that blog post. We're connecting maybe a YouTube video also to that blog post, to that reel. So now we have spokes that come off of that. We understand pillar posts and then like, you know, and then um, spokes that come off of that and like smaller ones as well. But now it's about how do we utilize that same fundamental essence, but then repackage it to today's world, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. And really what it is, that's also part of the content factory. That's how yeah. you overwhelm it, right? You, you need to hit it at two, three different levels because some people still like reading, you know, like yes. blog posts, you know, mm -hmm. I surprisingly to me, I had a couple of people email in asking for like print to click buttons, click to print. Yeah. On our articles cool. where I was like, in my head, I was like, who would be doing that? But everybody interacts with it in a different way. And I think it's really hard to get out of my own head and actually realize that at times, you know, cause like I can only think like me, no matter how empathetic I am, how, no matter how much I try certain right. things just don't make sense that you wouldn't think that way. I agree. It's a limitation on everybody. One thing that I've been not struggling with, um, I'm going to say kind of benefiting from in a way or experimenting with from an agency perspective is letting like is basically getting the right balance of productivity versus creativity you know mm -hmm. i'm always of the mindset is like you have to get it out people have to see it right where i know i push hard i know i have to get it done because ultimately i know like you know seo works from new blog posts or you know social interactions work when people see them so we need new content to get people drawn in on the other hand we've had a few tasks over the last couple of weeks where we let people just kind of go off on their own and say like my website, I've redone it 10, 15 times myself. And it just kind of gets to the limit of like how me and Steve can design a website, right? Because we're only that creative. We're not actual designers. We're, you know, it is what it is, right? It just reaches the peak of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas then I let um, Kyle and Daniel and my team kind of go off on it. And, you know, didn't ask them, you know, weren't really following up or whatever, but the stuff they came up with was just so much better. But it's also... It's tough to schedule. It's tough to quantify. It's tough to to pull it in. Yeah. How do you kind of walk that line between creativity and productivity, or do you ever kind of consider it? Even? Yeah. I mean, I think it's 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 always even in the sales game, right? We talk about speed to lead. So if it's if it's speed to publish, speed to implementation, to to increase that feedback loop, the more times we can, the more feedback we can get from that loop, the 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 faster the iterations can be, which I conceptually know. That's not how my brain works. So I, I hear you on that, right? And I think one of the things I'm working through, because I have a very small team, right? It's just me and just, you know, uh, my one other teammate. What I'm what I'm trying to do now is make sure that, okay, how do I go? This was something that I had picked up on uh, during my network marketing years, like years ago, right? Um, how can a dud do it to a stud? How do we compartmentalize the, 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 the how do we break down your superpower as much as possible? Right. And even more, it's even more prevalent now with um, the introduction of these AI tools, right? Because you are a subject matter expert, there's certain things that you're going to be able to process way differently than me because of just that's your unique skill set, right? But how much of that can now we unpack and compartmentalize to where it doesn't take a superstar like Kevin to do that actual thing and we can get it to a certain standard, right? So those are the things I'm working with and working through right now in, in the sense of if this was our standard, say, SOP for creating a video, now let's break it down to the components, right? You and I are, are not, I mean, not so struggling, but we have a challenge of how do we take now this content? One, we got to dial in our Ecamm stuff. We got to dial in the, the, the run of show and everything, right? And then we have to dial in certain things, but we said we committed to being messy. We're going to figure it out and we're going to do that because we're holding ourselves accountable to showing up. So if that's the case, great. We'll make things better, but we're going to hit record and we'll figure that out, right? But what can we do in that process to where can I remove myself and, 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 and can I remove and replace myself and then incorporate a tool that someone else running through a task can do to help get me there faster? It's kind of like the mindset I've been taking on things because now I know this and hold me to it. Cause it's going to be, it's been recorded. I committed at the top of the year to do a hundred videos. I'm still going to do that. There's obviously timelines have changed because of other things, no excuses. I'm still going to do that. But the rate in which I could do that, I'm so stinking excited about because of just these workflow enhancements that I have now, right? It should make things a lot easier to do. 
even with another tool I'm going to share with you later, from our original eCam kind of attempt to do things, I found another tool through Billy that like, changed up the dimensions on it and then chop up for us in a matter of seconds, bro. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of the content delivery, I think we have seven pieces today at minimum, but we're going to be able to spike that when we move on to the rapid fire section. So are you ready to yeah. move on there? Let's go. All right. Hold on here. Let me fire up the list because I've had a few that I've been kind of mulling over that, you know, I just know you're going to get better answers than me with them. Uh, and, and it's fun to hear your insights anyways with them. Okay. So if you can try to quantify this, what piece of content, if you had to dial back everything that you know about digital marketing, everything that got you to where you are today, can you remember the piece of content that started that? Ooh, there are moments. That's actually a book, by the way, that Mark Lack shared with me. Um, Cause that's how I, I kind of process things. I would say the very first introduction to the world of marketing was from one of my real estate mentors, Reggie Lau and his business partner, Lawrence Irby. Because before that, I thought copywriting was little C. It had to have a circle around it. <laughs> and it wasn't a piece of content in that sense. But it was education around the art of writing and being able to what once was ink on paper or pen on paper, which is now pixels on a screen, right? The magic of being able to put pixels on a screen and actually drive and transfer emotion to the point of where someone's taking out their credit card and then giving you money, mm -hmm. right? Dude, it's and like then a superpower. It's a superpower. And Dan Kennedy's, uh, I got the book behind me somewhere. Um, I want to say it's like one of them was also uh, the ultimate sales letter. The other one was the ultimate something else. But he talks about direct response. So if Reggie is one, Dan Kennedy is probably the first quote unquote guru, which we know is one of the godfathers, right? But the, the, very, the fundamental thing from that, that has always stuck with me, that gave me confidence to go from direct mail or physical into the digital world was the three M's. Message, market, media. Message, market, media, and everything you put out there better have a quantifiable call to action so you can test it. Mm. When did you know, like when I started this, I was an English teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe like four or five years ago, at some point, I became a digital marketer. You know what I mean? Like once I saw mm -hmm. a certain number thing, like where, you know how we started with the school channel, like now I can't even post to there because I'm a fraud if I'm on that channel, because I'm not a teacher anymore. I made mm -hmm. that switch to being a mid digital marketer. Probably the last time I would have identified as a teacher or a restaurant guy, five, six years ago. And that was after two, three years of digital marketing already. So yeah. like, when did you, when did you take the turn? When did you start considering yourself a digital marketer? I still loosely struggle with that. And I say that because it was another thought process, another way of thinking about that, that was introduced to me at the event in Newport, right? Um, there was a, a person who, you know, I connected with um, after he had spoke him and his wife, but he had said, I went on a personal journey to be unattached to, and I, I'm going to butcher the way he said it, right? But to be unattached in title, in connection with other things other than who I truly am and, and my true self. Right. Because oftentimes in our society, in our culture, we like to attach our um, vocation or our career to that person. And that is, typically becomes the identity. So there's been a lot of times where I've attached and, and unattached certain names, mainly because it helps the human the, you know, like to understand and, and put you in a box or a label. Right. But in terms of an educator, I feel as though I've always been an educator. If I kind of look back on it and answer that question now from where I am in terms of who I, I truly am or who I think I am now. As a digital marketer, we've been doing it for so dang long, right? And it's a matter of when do you, and it's, it's rhetorical because I can't really truly say when, but I know I've been in the marketing world for so darn long, right? For over a decade to where it's kind of like, if, is it a facet of who I am? Absolutely. Do I sit there and plant my flag and say, I am a digital marketer? That's all I am? No, but that's one of the things that we do. And I feel as though like more lately as I've had to put myself out there more to share that message, I need to make sure that I'm articulating it to the, to the, to the other re viewer in a simplistic way to where they understand who the fuck I am and why I talk about things. And, that, and I think that's really where it, it comes back to, right? Is there a, a when if I'm in certain business places? Cool. I'm a marketer. But outside of that, I'm just Tom, dude. I'm just the guy that loves playing basketball, that loves all things like geeky about marketing and business shit, you know? How about you? I'm interested in kind of how you answer that question. Yeah, like on a different thing, like, yeah, obviously for me, like identifying as a digital marketer doesn't take away from me being a dad or like, I don't, for one thing, I don't say I'm a basketball player anymore because my knees gave up on me three years ago 
and now you know i have my guy who practices karate you know like because it mm-hmm. it is what i'm doing and it's taken up that Point. amount of time so I, I know that it evolves and all that kind of stuff but yeah i can think of a, a few times where it just really took off you know and they they i guess they all kind of build on each other but basically you know probably after i'd been about a year of full-time marketing you know and then there's just a certain point like, I, I got to be honest with you. I know it's the right thing for me because of that geek out factor, because I can yep. look at like something like the cost per M and be like, oh, that's interesting. Or it's like, oh, wait a second. Our cost per click is this, but our cost per outbound click is that. Ah, and not getting mad at the the price difference. Just thinking like, oh, that's opportunity. Okay. Somebody else wouldn't see this right here. So the fact that it is a puzzle is, is maybe what keeps it fresh for me in yeah. terms of Dude, you know what? I'll tell you how I, the day that I became a digital marketer, I started working with this corporation. I took over their Google ads account. And when I got in there, there was like this flashing red button that said, increase the budget. Like basically it probably wasn't flashing, you know, like this is the way I tell it now, (laughs) but it was essentially (laughs) saying, take them from $5 to $25 a day. So I clicked that day one, they got 71 leads or something. And then the president of the business calls me up. He's like, what did you just do? How did you know how to do that? And then I just realized like, yo, there, there's been another professional on this account. But I just, it's like that, the opportunity to see the thing that actually, she'd seen the button too, right? Yeah. But chose not to press it, mm-hmm. right? Where I was like, well, let's see what this does. And then dude, like I said, 70 plus leads. And then all of a sudden I went from, here's a $500 video to a, you know, like a pretty big monthly contract. So it's right. just that kind of thing. And then after there, I was just realizing like, okay, you know, get, you know, same thing you were saying, surround yourself with good people, have somebody with a good plan. You know, I was uh, in the BGIM at that time. So I'd hop on a call with Rhea. She'd set it up with me. You know, I'd hop on a call with Casey who laid out the whole campaign for me. It was crazy how stuff like that just kind of worked. And over time you get the experience of seeing, and then all of a sudden, you know, like I can read it without reading now. If that Mm -hmm. means something, I see the results. I'm like, oh, what does this mean? And somehow Mm -hmm. there's a frame of reference that I can't even quantify how that happened, except just looking at it for hours and hours and actually thinking because I'm actually interested in it as opposed to just like trying to, you know, report the numbers that happened. Like, why did these numbers happen? It goes back to the cliche, like, you know, uh, a statement of uh, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? It's super cliche, but at the same time, it's like you think about it, we know that in being in the trenches, there's certain things you look at and you're like, I'm going to have to do it. I don't, I don't enjoy that, right? But the game, the arts, what we do, if we didn't have a passion for it, we wouldn't even be here just trying to start a fucking video podcast right now. 